Hi, welcome to lecture 30. In this lecture, we're going to go through uh, a couple of examples dealing with isotropic processes involving an ideal gas. Uh, at the beginning here, I'll just uh, give a little bit of re review. The picture that you see up in the corner there, up, up there, uh, that's of a, um, uh, a schematic of a diesel cycle, like an internal combustion engine. And there are four processes, there are four strokes in that diesel cycle. Uh, the first one's an intake site an intake stroke, that's where the air and the fuel come in. You can see that there's a valve open in that particular image. Piston is moving down, it's pulling in the air and the fuel mixture. And then after that, we have the compression cycle. That's the, that's the compression stroke, I should say. That's the stroke that we're going to take a look at in one of the examples. So here, the valves are closed, the piston is moving upward, and you're compressing the fuel-air mixture. Once it's compressed enough, it'll actually ignite. So in the diesel cycle, you ignite the fuel-air mixture through a high pressure. And then you get the power stroke. So this is where the, the fuel-air mixture ignites, pushes down on the piston, it moves down, it turns the crankshaft, and you get power out of that. And then the very last stroke there is the exhaust stroke. Here the piston is moving back up, but then you have an, uh, an exhaust valve that's open, and you get rid of the byproducts from the combustion process. So the, the, burnt fuel air mixture goes back out and then the cycle repeats itself. So that's what a diesel cycle is. We're going to talk more about that later in the course. Uh, but since we have an example on it today, at least with the compression stroke, I thought I'd go ahead and just describe it to you right now. There's a link uh, given in the picture there. If you want more information about the uh, diesel cycle, you can take a look at it there. Plus there are many, many videos online that you can take a look at to learn more about diesel cycles, auto cycles, things like that related to internal combustion engine uh, performance in thermodynamics. So we'll go ahead and get started on the lecture. All right, so let's go to the set of notes. Um, here we are. We're going to start with just a reminder from lecture 25. Uh, if you go back to that set of notes, it's been a while ago, um, you'll see that we did some derivations there and the, the first derivation that we focused on, well, if you go, that, that we'll focus on here, but if you go back to those notes, you'll see that we had written down an expression for the change in entropy. Oh, having some troubles here. We have the, uh, the change in ent specific entropy for an incompressible substance. It's just solely a function of temperature. It looks like this, where that's the specific heat. Obviously, if we're dealing with a, an uh, an, an isentropic process, then what that means is that the temperature would have to be uh, a constant. So isentropic process for an incompressible substance would mean that the temperature remains a constant, right? If you take a look at that, if you set the left-hand side equal to zero, it just means that the temperatures have to be the same. So that one's kind of a a trivial example here for an in incompressible substance. The one for an ideal gas, we've been using this expression quite a bit in the course, uh, at least in recent lectures. So we have the change in entropy over on the left-hand side. We have these s naught terms that are a function only of temperature. And then we have the uh, natural log of the pressure. It keeps doing that on me, sorry about that. So then we have the natural log of pressure term. This is the one that uh, we'll focus a little bit more on. If you go back to that lecture 25, you can see that we can rearrange that expression and define a quantity called P sub R. P sub R is known as a relative pressure. So P sub R, it's defined as a relative pressure. It's not really a pressure. It's a, it's a term that has um, the units of pressure. Well, actually, it doesn't even have the units of pressure. It's used to find pressures for an ideal gas undergoing an isentropic process. If you recall, it's, uh, if I remember, it, 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 the way it was defined was, I believe, exponential of s naught t over the gas constant r. It basically comes from this expression up here, just doing some rearranging for an isentropic process. Okay, so you can go back to lecture 25 and look at the derivation for it. But what we use that relative pressure for is to find uh, pressures in an ideal gas undergoing an isentropic process. So the 
pressure ratio, P2 over P1, is just PR, which is found at temperature 2, over PR, which is found at temperature 1. So just that expression there. Similarly, if you go back to lecture 25, you can find an expression relating the specific volumes, like in the expression below that. So V2 over V1 is the relative volume at temperature 2 over the relative volume at temperature 1. Again, it's not really a volume, but we call it a relative volume because we use it to find specific volumes. Again, these two expressions are only valid for an ideal gas undergoing an isentropic process. We can find the relative pressure and the relative uh, specific volume from the ideal gas tables like you see over here on the right hand side of your screen. If you look, this, this is the ideal gas table for air. There's this column over on the right hand side for the relative pressure. You can see it's a function of temperature and then the relative volume which is also a function of temperature. So it just gives us a little more convenient way to find pressure variations and specific volume variations when when, uh, when we're dealing with ideal gases undergoing an isentropic process. Alternately, if you, don't want to, if you don't want to deal with the PR and V sub R, you can always go back to this expression and then just set the left-hand side equal to zero. Then you get a relationship between temperature and pressure, which is kind of like this one down here. And then you can use the ideal gas law to find the specific volume. And then lastly, if you go again back to lecture 25, you'll see that we had derived an expression for what happens when you're dealing with a perfect gas. Keeps doing that on me, sorry about that. Perfect gas undergoing an isentropic process. And then we get these expressions. These are given in your formula sheet, you know, the exam formula sheet. Just relates specific volumes and temperatures, pressures, temperature, pressure, specific volume. Just gives a relationship between all of those quantities. The K here is the specific heat ratio, which is the CP over CV. Again, this one is specifically for an, an, a perfect gas. Let's see if I can get this to respond to me properly. Uh, I'm using a new, new uh, tableting software and I'm having some troubles with it here, so I apologize that you have to bear with me. Well, anyway, you can see that we're, we're dealing with a perfect gas undergoing an isentropic process for these expressions. So when you use these various expressions, it's important you keep in mind what, the, what all the assumptions are so that you don't um, use them improperly. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and get started on the examples. There are two examples in two separate videos, so we'll, we'll end it there.